Absolutely. Well, well, they're they're like wild strawberries. You need a concentrated. Yeah, you need a butt ton of them. But my God, they're so yeah. yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Are these also the small plants, CG, or, or are you yeah, talking about these? Yeah, these? these plants are, I don't know that I've seen many that are more than a foot tall. Yeah, they're, they're what my father-in-law refers to as, as the um, the European blueberries, which he says have a much smaller berry, and it, it doesn't grow, the, um, the height of, of the bush doesn't grow over about a foot, and he says they're much better. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that because um, when my in-laws, who are German and Slovenian, um, moved to Canada, had no idea that blueberries were actually edible until they tried them and they actually had flavor. So wow. the, you know, Sudbury's wild blueberries are are, are special. Yeah, well, apparently Czech blueberries are short and good and very small. Fair enough. I, I just, I didn't, all I know is what my in-laws have told me because I haven't really done extensive research on a place I'm not going to see in a very, for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the same source anyway. <laughs> So, um, I know one of the ones that, that I've used a fair amount, partly because of my fondness for Melomills, is, um, and I used it in the, thank you, yeah, I used it in, I used it in the, uh, strawberry, the 7-1-B, and that, every time I've used it, and, and, you know, I mean, it requires that you, that you pay attention to it. And, you know, and, and feed it when it needs feeding and whatnot. But as long as you do that, it's very well behaved. And it results in a lovely, full-flavored, very round, complex mead that, uh, I mean, at least every time, except maybe this time because of the heat, I'm not sure how far we're going <laughs> to go here. Because the strawberry is going along just about as good as the blueberry. Um, which, you know, strawberry's got the 7-1-B. But every time I've done it and had, you know, not a, not a too hot ferment, it has come out amazingly well, you know, and it's drinkable right out of the pail and, you know, goes into the bottles perfectly and, you know, ages well. I mean, just all the way around, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very solid yeast in my experience. Yep. It's got good fermentation kinetics. It uh, is a pretty wide range. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's also very good if you're using it in... Uh, red wines because it does uh, reduce um, malic acid. Um, it doesn't do a, um, a malolactic fermentation like some people think it does. It, it actually splits the uh, malic acid, which has two acetic acid groups that forms the malic acid. And when it splits those two, it produces CO2 and lactic acid. And that's why you get that smoother, creamier mouthfeel with it. Yeah, I really like that that creamy character. That to me, at least, I really like that. It's it's something that I find very desirable in a mead. I definitely have to put it up higher on the list to um, do a side by side test with all of these in a in a, um, a traditional or something. Because usually, what I do when I'm making up a recipe is I try to figure out what yeast will fit best based on the literature. But I've never really compared it for myself, so. All I really know about 7-1-B is what it's been recommended for, and that the last time I set it up against uh, EC-1118, and the EC-1118 was sluggish as hell. It did the job eventually, and it went further than the 7-1-B, but the 7-1-B took off like a shot and ate everything in sight in a week. And the other thing I found with it is... Um, as I may have mentioned before, I like to cheat and do second run batches, and I have had a couple of second run batches done with 7-1-B that have had weird flavors because I think I forgot to relax back them. Ah, okay. Well, this one, I mean, speaking of it, you know, running through all the fermentable sugars in a week, pitch the strawberry the day after our last show. Mm -hmm. One uh, one point one four five was the starting, and when I checked it, when I racked it yesterday, it was at one point oh three zero. And uh, it's still going. So, yeah, I, the, there's going to be a trip to Trader Joe's for strawberry juice in my future. <laughs> yeah. 
So fortunately, I already have blueberry juice to to refeed the other one. This is going to keep eating the sugar. I'm going to keep giving it sugar. So yeah, <laughs> do something or it's going to be too thin. So, Step feed the sucker. Yeah. Well, this will be after I get off the phone and tomorrow um, or Thursday actually <laughs> when Pete's done working, it'll be like Pete. <laughs> Help me here. Yeah, I know. I don't have any way to crash it. It's a problem. I'm gonna the worst. The best I could do would be to put it in that 15.9 and fill it full of ice. I don't have a freezer. Put it in. So. I tell you, that there's nothing better than using K1V or EC triple one eight and just deciding exactly where you want to stop it with a nice big chest yeah. freezer and, and yeah, and just just kill it at that point. Put some sulfites in, bottle it up. Um, even keg it if you want. Put some. Um, a bit of spritz in there, and um, and then you can bottle straight from the keg if if you want to, and you keep everything cold. And it, it just works makes it so much easier to, to decide exactly what you want to do. And the advantage is you can taste it to decide where you want it to stop, and then just stop it at that point. Oh yeah, I, and I totally need to do that. It's just been something that just keeps falling off the priority list because until. Recently, I haven't been doing a lot of meads, so it wasn't really a big deal. Now it's like, now I've got two meads, and I'm like, crap, stop! You know, I need a freezer. You know, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not in the books for me. I don't have. I literally don't have room for it here. So. Well, the big freezer croaks, um, so I'm gonna have a big hole. Yeah, in a freezer. Yeah, I need one anyway. So yeah. Of course, the argument will be with my husband. He'll be like, no, let's fill it full of meat, and I'll be like, no, these carboys will fit in there really well. So, <laughs> Well, that's what that's what shelves are for. Put a shelf in there. Yeah, Put the meat no. underneath the voice, you know? Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, yeah, that's I'm going to be Craigslisting me for a freezer, definitely. But, um... There you go. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the ones that I have used in the past, and I've since stopped using because it had a flavor characteristic that I got, so I didn't care for it anymore... And it wasn't necessarily a, a bad thing. It was just something that I decided I didn't like. Was I was using a lot of Montreche back uh, years and years ago. And um, it was a solid yeast and turned out a good mead. But there was this, it had a flavor that no matter what kind of mead you made it with, you could pick out that flavor. And to this day, I can tell you if a, if a mead was made with Montreche yeast, because I learned to recognize it. Yeah, I've been on blind tastings and go like, oh, Montreche. And people are like, how did you know that? And I'm going, practice? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's that flavor that you're referring to is that burnt plastic that zips across the top of your hard palate. Mm -hmm. That's exactly that, right, yeah. And that comes, if you don't have temperature control, don't use Montreche. But, you know, I've tasted that's, that that's in um, professional meats. Well, down to yeah, yeah, but I've tasted that in professional meads that I know do have jacket and tanks, and that's why I always thought that was interesting that you could pick it out no matter what. It seems like. Now, if you keep the temperature down, you don't get that plasticky flavor. Okay. So. I don't use it. I don't. I don't care for it as a yeast personally, and it's been my experience that if you don't have temperature control and you keep it at the lower end of its temperature control. Then you get that kind of profile that you're talking about. Uh -huh. But if you keep it low and slow, you're good to go. Well, I think that's true of a lot of yeast, though. You're going to get off notes if you stay out, if you get outside that temperature profile. Well, D forty seven is really known for throwing weirdness uh, that needs a lot of time to age out if you don't keep it at a low temperature. But I don't remember that happening the first time I used it, and I don't have temperature control. But now, because I know better, I only use it in in the winter up in the kitchen. Because, yeah, because the, the only time that it's cool enough in my house that I would want to use D47 is, is in the winter and not in my brew area either because my husband likes to keep his toes warm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with, with D47, um, anything over, you know, 60 to 60 degrees is pushing it. Because it will throw those, uh, they'll get some... Uh, you get some boozy heat from it. You get some uh, higher alcohols, and uh, you know it can do other things too, depending on what kind of uh, honey you're working with. But um, you cut out there for just well, a I use heat. What's that? 
I see. Likes it with Chardonnays is what he'd said. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you cut out on this end for just a second. We've got a uh, inbound question too when we get to that point. Huh. All right. Um, I just wanted to mention, you know, I've used D47 for um, uh, uh, methaglin, and I, I made a sage um, mead, and um, I think I like what it did, and the problems I have with it would be too much fresh sage that's taking a long time to age out. I never really tasted any harsh alcohols from it, so I think that's even cool. without um, even without proper temperature control, it, that one wasn't bad. Nice. Interesting. Um, Brian Galbraith uh, sent us in a question on Twitter, and he's asking, Pete, if you can talk about uh, W15 yeast strain. W15, Vaden Soil from Switzerland strain. Good for low temperature fermentations. It takes it a while. Maintains good fruit, good aromas, good, uh, um, you know, origin, uh, origin uh, from the blossom source. Uh, it's a really good one. That's another one that I would recommend blending. If I'm going to blend with that, I'd go ahead and use T306 in parallel and blend those two together. They both are pretty uh, pretty well suited to one another. Um, you can even go something like 58W3 or maybe even 2A23. Either one of those work really, really well with it. But I really like that yeast. That's one of my favorite yeasts. I guess if I were going to go, like, and put it up there in the top five, W15, along with uh, D21, BA11, um, QA23, 58W3, and I do, like all of those. Do you have particular styles that you tie those to, or does it just depend on what you're trying to achieve in a flavor profile? Um, mostly in the flavor profile, but if I'm doing, like, a... Uh, a dry mead that I want to have in the um, French Chardonnay slash Chablis Alsatian um, Gilbert Strainer um, or a swing or something like that, then I go with like a, um, a 58W3, QA23, T306, W15. Uh-huh. Uh, if I'm going for like a big strong dessert wine, uh, D21, D254, D47, uh, the D21 I'll blend with, uh, generally most of the time I blend that with the RP15, maybe just a little bit of the Syrah. Um, if I'm doing like a Melomel, uh, I do like 71B. Um, I also like uh, D80 another good one to blend with D21 and uh, D254 blends well with that um, Fizzy Meads obviously DV10 and uh, EC1118 um, Methaglins D47 works great in Methaglins um, R15 if I know not R15 R2 excuse me works great in Methaglins uh, 71B works very good in methaglins, especially blueberry methaglins. I don't know why that is, but it works really well in this. Hmm. That is interesting. We've got uh, Swordnut on the forum saying that he's been using uh, Kitzinger Reinhefe yeast from Germany. Uh, please pardon my pronunciation, I don't speak German. Um, says it's a very excellent yeast, thoroughly recommends it, um, serious contender to be showcased on the next airing, um, has been using their port wine for mead, um, says it's got a nice alcohol tolerance around 16% and can handle high sugar environments, so he's dropping it into 1.135 plus and it'll eat on average 10 points a day, starts doing this from a bit day two onwards despite being a gra high gravity environment. All it really needs is a decent stirrer, and it'll go off like a rocket. And he has the real advantage is its resistance to shifts in temperature without doing weird stuff immediately. Oh, nice. Yeah, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't impart too much of an alcohol heat. Um, I think it's the one that's meant for the port wines, and finds it very excellent for meads as well. Hmm. I haven't worked it's with that one. Yeah, well, sword nuts from Holland, so uh, probably has a different selection of yeasts available than we have here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would guess. 
but also mentions that a lot of their best me- best wines, not meads, have been made with ordinary bread yeast. So um, that was something that I wanted to talk about too, because I've made probably 40 or 50 Joe's Ancient Orange and um, variations on that theme.